Hello and welcome to the Getting There Show, where we speak with brilliant people and unpack the key influences and decisions that have helped them get to where they are today. You'll get the books, the mental models, the inspirations, and all the steps in their journey to help guide you on your own path. As Isaac Newton said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Today's giant is a brilliant guy called Philip Sturman, who started his career as a trainee mechanical engineer, but moved to a commercial role at Google. We explore how he got into Google, as it's a great story and is pretty unconventional, and who now runs a highly profitable multi-million euro bootstrap company called Comex, which helps businesses acquire new customers through artificial intelligence and a templated system for finding what he calls message market fit. We cover all sorts, like how to land a job in big tech, particularly Google, what Philip has learned about sales and marketing, the use of AI in business, how to bootstrap a company, and all the key influences and decisions that have shaped his path so far. We make sure to include all of Philip's toolkit and influences in the show notes, so as to maximize the chances that this show helps you get to where you want to get to. So Philip, how are you doing? Frederick, good to see you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm good. No worries. Um, so where are you right now? Um, I'm based in Berlin. I'm in my apartment. It's Sunday evening and we are going through another period of, uh, I would say, 70% lockdown. Um, okay. So German, Germany has been under a curfew again. And uh, yeah, just, just uh, grinding it out, I guess. Nice. So I remember last time we chatted... Um, you, you told me that your your business is split between Berlin and Cape Town, so I guess you're not going to be making Cape Town for the for the summer season. Yeah, that's right. So so we've always been a remote business, but this year was still peculiarly interesting because we got even more remote, right? So we had to in March we had to leave Cape Town actually, where we normally meet in the in the beginning of the year to skip a little bit of winter um, because the pandemic was happening, and you know we had to move all of our employees, um, you know basically to be fully working from home. We had quite a flexible setup before, but people had to stay home. So that was interesting. And um, now like we've been just running this ever since. Actually, South Africa just opened uh, last week um, for, for international travel again. So we're actually going to be going down for the end of year function in, um, in, in December, which is going to be nice because the team grew quite a bit, quite a bit there. And we, we literally haven't physically uh, seen them. So it's going to be good to catch up with some folks. Oh, great. And how long are you there for? So we're going down in the beginning of December, and right now, as it looks, um, if, if things don't get worse in Europe, uh, we, we probably just stay until, until mid-January. So not like super long, but, but still enough to get some sun in and uh, to spend Christmas and New Year's with, with some friends down there. And surfing, no doubt. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like I, just, I just chatted to a friend. He was actually, I, was, I wasn't planning on bringing my board because normally I've, it's easier access if you just rent down there. Um, <laughs> but now like he, he convinced me, so now I have to bring my board. Awesome. Well, Philip, the first question I want to ask you is um, about your your career path to date. Um, you've had a really, really interesting um, journey. Um, so it'd be really useful if you could just give us a sort of potted history of um, of, of how you've got to where you've got to today, um, starting from university. Yeah, sure. And please, please tell me if I if I go off too much because you know. Uh, it was a little bit of a, of a wild story, but I think everybody can relate to that to you as well. Um, after to what happened to all of us after joining Google. So, so I'm actually a trained mechanical engineer. I am, um, I grew up in a small coastal town in Northern Germany uh, called Kiel um, at the Baltic sea. And it was quite clear for me that I was not going to go only study business or, you know, basically just wasn't really focusing on one subject because I was quite good at math and chemistry um, in school, and I just felt it would be a waste just to study business, right? Even though I was super interested in the topic. So what I did was um, I just signed up for engineering. It was a very popular thing. You know, most of our mates studied mechanical engineering. It, you know, German engineers always needed that story. It was, you know, uh, providing 
it felt it was providing job security. I didn't grow up like, you know, in a very financially secure environment. So it seemed nice that, you know, you had a, had a, had a job for sure and would do something which is useful. And then actually started engineering um, without being too much into it. And while doing that, I actually realized that this wasn't re- like, it wouldn't be my gig forever. Like I, I, I thought the environment was quite masculine only. It wasn't really, you know, eccentric enough for me, I guess. And um, going through a traineeship with an engineering firm called Schindler, um, I got into actually online online marketing. And one thing that drove my interest in that was a person that I've met at actually backpacking through Argentina, an Australian guy who made millions building online shops and doing affiliate marketing while traveling South America. And for me as an engineer who mostly, you know, constructs computer admitted designs of, you know, rotor blades or, um, or solar panels and stuff like that, that was just unheard of, right? How I knew about the internet, I knew about internet companies, but I didn't know how a guy who wasn't even an engineer, like in terms of like coding, mm-hmm. was capable of building business and be so flexible. And since I always wanted to be an entrepreneur, I got super curious and I thought like that, that sounds interesting. So. I started looking more into what the internet was and then, you know, reading, started start, start to read actually stuff like the four hour work week from Tim Ferriss. And I knew afterwards that the way, you know, out of the classical, I felt conservative engineering world would be something um, with an internet company. And, and, you know, within Schindler, I focused on search engine marketing, which wasn't really a thing for them before. Um, took that thesis, um, applied with it for Google, Luckily, um, got chosen for some interviews, um, made it through, um, joined Google with 23 from a shit university, was highly intimidated by folks from Oxford like you, um, from all those like amazing, bright people, had an amazing time in Dublin, and my career for sure path was changed. Um, and after Google, um, like many others, um, we didn't stay for too long, but like for a good two years, I think. And I joined several startups after that, um, started multiple ones of my own businesses, which, which never really, you know, got, got that, that big, but I learned a lot through it and um, through the grind. And in 2017, through those learnings, we launched a uh, sales and marketing operations uh, company called Comex um, that now grew to 30 people without investors. We're completely profitable and, and just breached actually six and a half million annual recurring revenue, um, which allows us now to, basically decide how fast we want to go and how we want to build the company. So that was, of course, a very uh, quick story summarizing the last, you know, 10 to 10 to 15 years, but um, that that's basically how I ended up. So mostly corporate engineer going out, um, learning that corporate was not for me, trying a lot of things, doing a lot of things right, doing a lot of things wrong, and eventually finding something that is useful enough um, that helps enough people to make a business out of it. That's brilliant. Um, it's actually our ten-year anniversary since we since we started Google. So yeah, that's right. This, uh, like this conversation's come at the perfect time. Um, so yeah, November twenty ten. November twenty ten. Yeah, yeah. That's when we started. So thanks so much for laying it out, Philip. Um, what I'd really like to do now, um, for the benefit of the viewers, is to find out from you um, whether you've got any specific tips for you're getting into um, a big tech and and Google specifically, and then B um, running a successful, profitable business. Um, So, you know, the world of entrepreneurship. So let's start with, you know, getting into Google. Like if someone was to say to you, Philip, you know, give me tips on, on how to land a job at Google, what would you say? I think I would say something different than I would have said in 2010, because also my way wasn't that straightforward uh, into Google. And I'm not sure if it's actually even advisable or, you know, if if that would work for other people. But if it was today and people were interested in any job, really, not only big tech, but something they find fascinating and where they deem it's like pretty hard to get in, it's actually just, you know, get in touch with people who hold positions that you find interesting. Um, you can reach out via LinkedIn, just, just find those people and understand, you know, if that job is really for you and if you even want to get into that stuff, right? Um, and then just find out, you know, what, what those people did in order to get in. Because probably, you know, uh, hiring and, you know, overall um, things might have changed for many companies since you and I joined. And the best thing is always just to get people who are in that position right now. Um, 
but of course, you know, um, just to, to hone your skills into all those areas, you know, knowing what those companies are doing, understanding the specific fields, you know, is, is always a good idea, right? Um, if you're not really interested enough to understand how Google works, how Amazon or Netflix, how those companies work, then, you know, you probably, you probably wouldn't be interested in that, that job anyways, right? So there should be an intrinsic interest in, in what they do and then, the rest will follow probably by just getting the right information from the people who work there right now. And it's never been that easy to, to connect to people, right? It's never been that easy to get the information. And I think the general openness of people, um, you know, to, to provide advice, I think is, is rather increasing. So I, I just, you know, pick my dream job, find a person who has it and ask them what they do. Yeah. I think that's good advice. Um, I mean, one of the things that I was always really surprised about when, um, I interviewed people um, for Google when I was when I was there was how little they knew about the business. Um, so I think it's really really useful to to make sure you do you know deep preparation on you know what Google does you know how it makes its money you know w- what is its business model what drives its business model because um, because frankly if you can come up with you know some sit up statements which is what I I teach on my digital bootcamp, um, then, you know, interviewers will at least know that, you know, you've put in the effort to, to really, really understand the business. And, but what I'm keen to know is, I mean, you, you have quite an unconventional background, right? But what you did was you wrote your thesis about the application of SEM to a particular sort of niche market, um, i.e. the the world of, um, you know, engineering companies. And that seemed to, to, to really impress the interviewers. So I think and to be, to be completely honest there, I'm not even sure my interviewers at Google when I was in the interview with them were that aware, but what it helped me to achieve was that I couldn't score with my university because that wasn't really a well-known engineering school. Mm-hmm. And I didn't come from like a elite school. Right. But I think what sparked the interest was like, Oh, here's an engineer applying for a business position that, that mm-hmm. we don't have that that often. And he actually wrote a thesis. I'm not entirely sure if like, you know, a recruiter at Google read my whole thesis. And I actually don't really think, you know, probably I was 22 when I wrote this, right. And I'm not an academic. Like, so I don't really think, you know, it was a, it was a masterpiece. Right. But I, you, you sincerely show that you have like got into, you sincerely show effort. And it's very likely that back in 2010, nobody who worked for engineering firms, you know, was at the same time figuring out how to do CPC click campaigns for industrial products. So like, it probably raised eyebrows, you know, and it probably gets the eyeballs on that CV. And um, that's sometimes what you have to get to. You just have to stand out from the crowd um, in order to open doors. And did you enjoy your time at Google? I mean, we always, we always are raving about it, right? Like when we chatted over summer, like we always, we always said that, you know, while it was, it was specifically challenging and intimidating, like for a, for a young person like me to move to Ireland and, be exposed to so much great talent like I've never experienced before, right? Mm. The the density of just, you know, smart and lovely people. Like we agree, right? We've never seen anything like it afterwards. Mm. Right. It's 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 mind boggling how they did it. And back then we probably also took it mostly for granted. But once you're out there, and it's not that I really want to go back because that was a specific part of my or area, like phase of my life, which is now over and I look back at it and I don't I don't have any regrets of leaving Google. Um, but what I, what I do think about sometimes is how amazing the people were mm-hmm. on such a large scale, thousands of them, right? So um, that was very special. And how and why do you think that is? Like, why do you think Google was able to attract and sort of keep such high gallop, caliber people? So I think the. <clears throat> So I think the one thing, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough to say, but like one thing for sure was that Google was positioning. So they, they were very, very, very strict on like who would join the business. Right. And they were very much like leading, I think with, with values, which were more hitting the current sentiment and zeitgeist. Right. I think mm-hmm. none of us joined to make big money, even though we earned like pretty well, like and all of us were more on the progressive side. All of us wanted change. All of us kind of believed, that Google was the place where we could live out that change and learn a lot, right? And I think that just resonated with a specific group of people that then kept on attracting more people. So I think they mm. kind of gave, gave this, they created this magnetism mm. around interesting people working on interesting stuff that is growing fast. And then of course they had like amazing processes 
which were very humane and focusing on the humane and people that, that facilitated that. But I think they also hit a nerve with a certain generation of people back then that just didn't want to do the basic stuff. If they were going out for a job, they didn't want to do the normal job. I didn't want to keep on constructing machines and plants in a, in a dark office, right? I wanted to do other stuff. Hmm. And uh, I remember we we also talked about um, a book um, that you know Reed Hastings, the founder of Netflix, wrote. Right. Um, and you you sort of talked a bit about that um, in our last conversation. Um, well, how do you think that applies to to Google? Right. So so yeah, that's an interesting one, right? So the the, the, the like Reed Hastings and like I think um, you know he 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 wrote a book together with a co-author about how Netflix works and it's called um, No Rules Rules because Netflix is known for having very little policies in place. Um, so there's no vacation policy. You do not have to ask for approval when you, you know, uh, take huge bets, financial bets sometimes on movies. Those people have sometimes complete financial freedom as long as in the, in the interest of the company. It's quite magnificent how they, how they do not think in complete chaos. And the one thing he's mentioning, why this is working and why those, like the, the, the way they designed that company to, to grow so large as Netflix is right now, um, that the whole freedom that people get wouldn't work without talent density. Mm. And they, that's also why they have such a relentless hiring and, and firing culture, right? People don't work that long in Netflix if they're not a fit anymore because the main thing, how they evolved is like keep that talent density extremely, extremely high. And I thought about this a lot that, you know, just the talent density at Google uh, was also just pretty insane. Like I've never seen anything like it before. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, let's also now um, spend a bit of time on uh, what you would say to others who want to start their own business. Cause obviously now you're, you're running a, a hugely you know, profitable, um, successful company. You must've learned, a lot of things, um, you know, over the past four years. Um, and I'd be interested to hear what, what they are. Yeah, that's, that's, and that's a difficult question. And if I knew, like, I cannot claim I figure it out, but I definitely know uh, I've learned a couple of things that I just wouldn't do again. And, and, and it has worked very well for us. So I think the first thing that we learned and we know is that it, it usually depends also on your personality and how you want to live your life um, and how you, what do you want to make out of your career? So I think what, what I learned from me is that like, I cannot be employed that well. So therefore I always found other areas of providing value, which was in a more freer and entrepreneurial way. And not every person is like that and that is fine, but I always had an easier time, even though it involved more hours and more stress of like doing my, my own products and providing my own solutions than following somebody else doing their stuff. So the, the degree of autonomy and doing things yourself was always quite important for me. What I've learned is and that's specifically true for us. And I think there's more and more businesses like that is that, so we don't have any investors, right? Nobody really financially helped us in the beginning to, to get the company off the ground. So what we had to do was to fix an, a pressing problem for our customers fast enough and good enough so they would pay us for it so we could use that money to build the company. And what, what we've been like sticking to really is just like being useful, being useful to other people, solving their problems, forgetting about your own stuff. And if you can do this for one person, eventually you can do it for five. If you can do it for five, you can eventually do it for 10 or 50. And if you do it well and the issue is big enough and the value generated through solving that issue is big enough, eventually you get the resources to reinforce that thesis, right? Into other businesses. And um, that's really what we've been focusing on all along. Like we've been really obsessed with our customers and their problems. And this was a way, way, I think more pleasant journey than some of the stuff that I've did before where we executed on an idea and a hypothesis that wasn't confirmed with anybody. Eventually no problems were solved. And hence, we burned a lot of cash off investors, uh, got a very stressful period, and nobody could particularly put their finger on what went wrong afterwards, right? And I would just sum that up with like many people and startups, especially, are just not really useful. <laughs> Absolutely. And if you're not if you're not really useful, it's hard to make that case. And there's exceptions, of course, right? But we operate in that realm where we like to operate independently around the problems of our target group and do not have investors uh, tell us how fast we got to grow, but, but rather see how far we can push it ourselves. And what, problem, and what problem do you solve at Comex? 
So, so yeah, comics is like, so we've evolved, right? So at first, comics was basically a database solution that allowed uh, B2B companies to uh, work with their CRM systems in a GDPR compliant way. It was on the verge of 2018, GDPR was being, you know, um, implemented. And that just meant that, you know, overnight, hundreds of thousands of, you know, B2B businesses would be not compliant. We basically built a database solution that allowed them to understand where the data came from, you know, what people they could contact with the direct sales teams and how to clean that data, right? So that's how we started out. But what we learned later was that the real business problem wasn't really to be GDPR compliant, but that, you know, B2B businesses who have very complex solutions and products and hence need people to sell them um, are not as well equipped in their commercial operations, as we call it, so in their money-making departments of that business, as we thought. So like you and I have been working for Google. We learned very early, not thinking about it really, how a highly profitable sales machine looks like. I mean, there's rarely any companies, you know, next to Google, maybe Amazon or Facebook, who are as profitable, who make as much revenue per person in that building, who make as much profit um, per person in that company. And when coming out of out of that, like, working for startups, but also doing my own engagement as a as an advisor and consultant, I realized like, hang on, actually most businesses are in terrible shape commercially. And, and why is that? And um, we've been trying to fix those problems ever since. And we focus on two specific problems that we've figured out over hundreds of cases now that we really feel make or break a B2B business um, if you are between 10 and 200 people. And that is number one, can you predictably reliably GDPR in a GDPR compliant way, generate enough sales meetings. Can you do that or can you not do that? And how dependent are you on people to do that, right? And what we do to solve the problem for our customers who can't do that is that we actually find message market fit because any meeting with people, if you have direct sales teams, they need meetings, right? That's a fact. And any meeting only takes place if you are interested enough for a prospect to want to meet with you. And the only thing you can do there is to come across as interesting through communication. So we find the message and the, the, the communication that matches the market sentiment for people who find you interesting enough to meet with you. So once this is solved, this is a big thing, actually. Once this is solved, you never have to worry about meetings again. Our customers never have to worry about meeting again once they're done with it, right? And meetings are not everything, right? You also need to sell and make deals. Right, because that's where the revenue comes from. That's where the fuel and the air of your of your business comes from. And what we've learned is, especially with B two B businesses, is that the cost of sales, which means that the cost it takes you to acquire a customer, is exceptionally high. Because not every business is like Google or Amazon, where you know you have, almost have a monopoly, right? And customers are flying in. Many people are actually fighting over business, and that means their cost of sales are extremely high, which means they're have to invest a lot of resources, have to invest people, training, right? The offer is not entirely clear. It takes a lot of time and energy to convert customers over. And that's a huge issue because um, any business is just as profitable as it makes enough money in return it takes them to acquire a customer, right? If you have to spend too much cash in order to acquire revenue, sorry, <laughs> then, then, you, then you run into issues very quickly, right? And most sales departments... Um, in the, in the SMB segments are, are not really aware of that. And the main driver of those costs of sales are actually those long sales cycles, those like six months, 12 months, 18 month sales cycles for those big products. And we basically found a solution with while generating message market that to understand the sentiment better, to improve your offers, to be at the right customer at the right time when they actually need you, that is shortening sales cycles down to sometimes, you know, weeks or days when it took them months, right? And we really believe we're onto something special here because we learn like just from business economics, all the stuff we've done for our customers, we implemented for ourselves. And we see now how we can profitably can grow. If you have a solution that works, if you're actually providing value and you figure out message market fit and your deal cycles, um, things will change very quickly for you as a business. And, and that's what, we, what we're implementing with our platform, but also with our team for our customers. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hugely impressive. Um, and one of the things that I find most interesting about comics is the fact that you have built an engine so it's clearly, you know, a machine that's powered by artificial intelligence, but it's also got a sort of heavy human component too. You've built a sort of templated process um, that you you use to sort of hold your your clients' hands. 
Um, could you talk a bit more about that? Right. So I think, and I'm always quite frank and honest about that, right? Every AI company that, that claims that everything is done by machines is simply not telling the truth. Like, and there's always still humans involved. And we just decided to be open about that instead of like um, brushing over it as if that, if that wasn't true, right? So there's a couple of amazing businesses, um, you know, <clears throat> Um, like Gong, for example, who, who uses um, you know language processing to under, understand phone calls better and similar technology that we use to actually understand email communication, marketing communication better. But all of those companies still will have um, you know people involved, you know, helping to make those processes work. And what we basically do is um, we have we have two components actually where what we call AI or machine learning takes place. Number one is we analyze the communication of our customers uh, with their target group, right? So we see what sentiment is out in the market. We see what conversations were rather were positive, which ones were rather negative, what stuff resonates. And, and that sometimes is already a big, big chunk of things we then implement. However, to put this into context, to actually help our customers, um, we of course have a team facilitating those, right? Because um, we just see better results. And we're not ashamed to say that there's, you know, you know our support and customer success team actually implements things for our customers because we get the results, right? And um, everybody who claims that just AI will do the job um, is not to be taken serious, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I, I read something really um, interesting recently that showed the contribution um, to revenue of um, sort of services to the large SaaS companies. And it was really quite surprising. So, you know, companies that you'd assume would make, you know, 100% of their revenue from selling product we're actually making up to 50% from, you know, selling services, which are, um, you know, delivered by humans. Um, so yeah, um, you're absolutely right. It's, um, it, it's a bit of a misnomer that, you know, AI companies are just machines. Um, there's always humans involved. Um, yeah, I think we've all been feeding, like set this impression in the past, especially through big tech and like those big machines and data centers that we don't know how they work, that everything is just running without humans getting involved. But, but even back then at Google, if you remember, we had this SQ, SQE team, I think, search quality engineering team at Google. And I'm not sure if they still exist, but those guys were definitely going through, you know, manual search keywords, sorting out that there was not any, you know, pornography or like disturbing images being fed to normal search users. And this was a manual task. And eventually algorithms got better and better and helping out to make that faster. But um, even back then, and you know, Google wasn't small back then, right? Even in 2010 to 2015, I'm not sure if those you know, uh, units still exist. Like we had people at Google sorting out things manually, um, helping out to make that service better, right? And, um, but that's of course nothing you, know, you get told um, when, you, when, you, when you sell that big story of like, yeah, that's, that's just, you know, that's just tech. Like, you know, particularly investors. to investors. I, I think investors <laughs> like, like the machine only story because they, yeah. they can, they can kind of, they, they can see that, you know, that the, the business trajectory is going to be kind of infinitely scalable. Um, exactly. Yeah. So the next thing I want to do, Philip is um, drill down a bit into the sort of influences um, that um, have had a big impact on you and your journey. So um, the first thing I'd like to know is, books so is there a, a particular book that has really guided you and um your your decisions up to now so yeah so there's <laughs> i told you this and i was always quite embarrassed to speak about this because i i wasn't a big reader and i still am not a big reader because i actually fall asleep very quickly when i start reading so during my master's at copenhagen business school where we had to read a lot of social scientific and, and philosophical papers i had to get a standing desk in order not to fall asleep to make 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 it through like because it's so bad for me and i was always quite ashamed of it um and only i would say the over the last five years i've picked up um the audible and, and actually go through quite some content there and of course you know there's plenty of stuff i could be speaking about right now so of course tim ferris with a four-hour work week right and you know also uh, I, I, I plowed through stuff like from, from Reed Hastings just over the last couple of weeks. But the one thing I think, um, if you ask me who, which was, was a profound impact at that time, and there might be more, but, but let's just choose this one for today, was actually Eckhart Tolle with The Power of Now, which I got exposed to during a period of like pretty extreme stress. Um, it was, you know, in the first couple of years of comics and we're just like hoovering over profitability, not really paying ourselves salaries. It was just like a hectic period, one might say, right? And, um, 
and that really like so i was aware of mindfulness before um so for the people who don't know Eckhart Tolle, it's hard he's not a really guru he's like he's not really a lecturer he's he's probably a spokesperson for mindfulness and applying that to life situations and um through that i got more into meditation even though i'm no i'm like you know i'm not i'm not i'm not i'm no buddhist i'm no monk but I, but i use meditation actually daily and through that i also got into getting myself a business coach and just like really asking myself are you making the right decision and are the are the decisions really conscious or are they based out of fear or out of like you know regret or anger eventually right and and i think i would have never gotten that perspective on my decision making uh, without that book from Eckhart Tolle because it made made me see it so obviously how certain decisions and also certain um almost like self manipulative behavior which all of us do right and i had in the past for sure was just not helping any further and i think like he's a million dollar guy for sure like he's <laughs> without eckart um i probably would have not f- found that gateway and do, and can you see that your decisions are are better now since you've you've read that book i think it's all, there's there's more than this you don't or not only read a book and then you make the right decisions and all of a sudden you run a million million dollar business right but the what mindfulness, of course, is teaching you, and the, the, the practical approach of Eckhart Tolle was a very, you know, real practical approach towards it, where you don't get the feeling of like this mumbo jumbo or like any spiritual nonsense, really, but rather a very practical approach to life. It's just like how you realize how your mind sometimes takes off, and how many things you do are just not conscious, and mm. um, that doesn't mean you always take poor decisions, but you sometimes, when you look hard and long enough at the stuff you sometimes did and wondering why did certain things not pan out the way I wanted to be? Why do my relationships maybe sometimes are not as fruitful as I want them to be? Why, you know, um, we in the founders team struggle sometimes to get the right decisions out or maybe struggle with conflict in certain stressful situations. And mindfulness just shows you the real reasons for that and helps you to dissolve the real reasons. And I think that that was just extremely helpful, just learning that this was possible. And that, but there's many ways um, h- how we got to that point as a founder's team as well to apply that, right? It's not only meditation or like Eckhart, Eckhart Tolle, but he was definitely the gateway. And then we found other channels and tools, for example, business coaches who help us just, you know, externalize our viewpoints, right? Um, and I think, yeah, so, so the power of now definitely was, was one of the things that, you know, nudged me into that direction for sure. And um, let's look at another type of influence. I mean, I'm a, as you know, a big fan of quotes. Um, is there a particular quote that is always sort of top of mind when you're, um, you know, sorting through um, uh, you know, difficult decisions? So we have, we have a couple of principles and, um, at comics, um, and, but they're not really quotes. So we have the principle, for example, of clarity over harmony. It's not really a quote, it's just a principle, which means that we have to speak up even though it's uncomfortable to, you know, to have clarity over harmony because harmony might feel nice in the beginning, but then eventually bites in the butt later. Things like that, right? We have freedom and responsibility at comics, but it's not really a quote. It's more like, okay, you know, act freely, but act responsible <clears throat> for the goals to be set out to do. But the, the, the one quote, I think that, um, and it's, oh, I'm not sure if it's a quote, but it's something my grandfather used to say a lot. Um, and my grandfather has passed away since many years, right? And um, he, he turned 97. So he was born in 1909. And they, he was just this amazing guy. It's like, and very warm, warm guy. And what, what struck with me is, that, is the quote itself is not as powerful, but coming from that person who was born in 1909, lived through two world wars, right? Mm-hmm. Actually, got to see everything from like, you know, living in absolute poverty to like the, 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 the flourishing of the Western world in a way, like having a person uh, seeing that. He always said like the only, you know, permanent thing in life that exists is change. And that's like, you know, it, it sounds like, you know, if, if somebody who is 20 years old today says that it's just like, oh, wow, it's no brainer, right? <laughs> because we're so exposed to change all the time. But somebody of that of that age, mm-hmm. right, who is also, of course, exposed to change, but also a generation where we normally would say, like, they were not that flexible, right? But but it's actually quite the opposite. I think we're not that flexible sometimes. And um, and just that's, that's just with us a lot. Just like understanding that the only thing, you shouldn't hold on to anything but to the, realization that change is the only thing that always will happen right 
And how has that kind of manifested itself in the way that you, um, you and your team run, run comics? It's, it's hard to say really, because I'm not so sure if it's, if it's manifested, um, you know, that much in the company, but I try to remember, uh, that specific sentence when I struggle with change, because we all the human struggle with change. We like things to be safe. We like things to be permanent. We like things to be comfortable. Right. And hence we sometimes hold on to things which are just simply not working anymore or simply are not helpful or useful anymore. And whenever those phases come in and you, you want to hold on to stuff or you're afraid of stuff because if we change what might happen, right? If we, if we do this, if we do this new ad on Facebook, if we do this new, new feature, we might be judged, right? But if you, if you just understand that things is constantly changing anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Um, and change is the only way forward. It's not a specific idea or it's not a specific solution or a specific way, but, but the change itself is actually what, what has to happen all the time in order to get it right, then, you know, dealing with that change, which sometimes is uncomfortable and scary, um, just becomes a little bit easier, right? It puts things into the perspective for me. One of the things that um, I was really impressed by is your very quick response to the, uh, the corona pandemic. Um, immediately on sort of comics website, you, you've carved out some space to, to sort of help your, your clients kind of manage um, you know, manage this very uncertain time. Um, from the outside, it looked like that was almost a direct manifestation of um, your your grandfather's um, words of wisdom. Yeah, pro- so like because that's the thing. So what do we do, right? I was actually on like I was. I, I had to. Re- we were in Cape Town when when you know the pandemic was called out in March, and we kind of had to change our flights and get back. I had to cancel my vacation with Kira, like so. You know, I'm not I'm not complaining because we're all healthy and you know our business running well. I think people had it way worse, but of course in that moment um, it was it was pretty challenging because you know there was definitely change put upon you, right? And what we what we decided for very quickly was that we could either just like be be mad that this is happening and like find it unfair, or we could eventually use the time to produce something valuable. And what I found very valuable, that's why I didn't even come up with this. I think it came to us by customers reaching out to us and sharing what, what they've been doing from like, you know, people who really were struggling to other customers who had those brilliant ideas who, you know, were, were fully remote set up and had like 120 people teams, just like, you know, everybody chipping in and figuring out that situation when nobody could enter the office. Right. It's not like right now, like right now, it seems like we're in this now for like, you know, three quarters of a year almost. Right. And now we think that's normal for some businesses that wasn't so normal. Right. And, um, people just sharing that we just started documenting this, did some interviews, like wrote down the best practices and, and, and looked if that was helpful for other people. Mm. And has it, has it been helpful for, I mean, have you had you know, good feedback on it? Uh, we like, that's interesting. Right. So we thought, okay, let's just spin up this page, do those interviews, <clears throat> you know, do a little bit of content. It wasn't even like, because, you know, we're not really a, we weren't really focusing on generating leads with anything, right? It was just like, let's just be useful. And we st- still get downloads every day of our Corona guide for B2B businesses. Mm. So it still seems to, you know, serve a certain sentiment. Um, was it helpful? You know, I, I, I'd say so. Um, I, I reckon the things we recommended back then are now all, you know, common knowledge, but, um, if it was all that clear to people, we wouldn't see that much response still, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I hope so at least. And, um, I want to um, talk a bit about, um, cause this, this, uh, show is all about employability and, and helping people get to where they want to get to. I want to talk a bit about interview questions. Um, cause you must've interviewed a lot of people in your, uh, in your career now. Um, what is your your favorite interview question. And um, once you've told me what your favorite interview question is, how would you yourself answer it? Right. I mean, like, you know, when, when you actually work for Google or back then, we went through this massive growth phase, right? So I think when we joined in November 2010, it was probably one and a half thousand people. And when we left, we were beyond the 3,000 people, right? And we, we, like you and me included, we had to interview a lot of people. And um, at Comics today, um, 
So we grew from like, I think 12 employees to 30 this year. So we also have quite some interviews under our belt. And we use a similar process um, that we used at Google back then. So at Google, for example, um, they used a situational-based question mm -hmm. framework, which back then wasn't so common, but right now people know about it. Situational-based questions means, hey, Fred, imagine a situation where you are in the office, X, Y, Z is happening. How would you respond? And how can you relate this to your past experience, for example? So they base it on a situation that you might find yourself in. And... We do this too at comics, but then the one thing we do outside of this normal framework is we ask for people in, 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 in the last interview section of each interview, we ask for um, different stuff. And we call those interview sections the spark. And why do we call the spark is because we have those, we have the rule that we don't work with awful, quite frankly, right? We want to be capable of like being very comfortable about the people we work with. That means there has to be chemistry, or just people have to, have to have a heart, like we're not interested in A players and assholes. We're interested in people who are A players and have a heart, basically, right? And that's why we ask for the spark. And one interview questions um, we, we do there, mostly in the beginning, which I like a lot, is, um, is always, dear candidate, what would you do if you, had not, like, if you did not have to work for any resources anymore? If anything was taken care of, like the work you would do would not impact your financial resources, you could, financially um, afford anything you like, no matter if you worked or not. Like, so what would you do, right? It normally gives like quite a good idea of the intrinsic interest of people, what they are really into. Funnily enough, many people struggle quite a bit to answer that question. I think it's also not an easy one. And how I would answer that, um, I think it also changes, to be honest, over time, because as many entrepreneurs, my mind is going places in different directions. So it probably depends on the phase of my life. But what I would probably always do would be working on solving certain problems together with a team, right? So like I've, I've, been, I've, I've been doing team sports my whole life, not so much anymore because, you know, work is now my team. But the whole thing we do for me is just, it's just a sports thing, right? We're a team. We're here to win a trophy or like solve a problem and we do it together. And I did competitive rugby, I did, I did rowing in high school, right? And the, the main thing that, um, that really energizes me and gives me good flow is actually working on stuff with the team. I also do like engineering around certain things. I like to find solutions for stuff by myself, but finding big problems and aligning on those and working with other people who are fully aligned just gives me great energy. There's this one, like, I think there's this one interview from Eric Schmidt where he talks about that the feeling that you get when you set out to a goal and it's messy and slowly but surely everybody gets aligned and you just feel how all of a sudden everybody's just like pulling to the right direction. And it feels, the analogy with a rowing boat is so, so accurate because if you've ever been rowing like an eight man or four man boat, you feel immediately if something is off, right? And you feel, you feel on the other hand as well, those very clean strokes, which are just like hundred percent clean. It's just gliding. Right. And everybody's just, everything is just on point. And I think you get, I get the similar sensation almost from like when we go through messy periods where we launch new features or when we have, you know, departments transitioning, you know, new roles creating, right. When things are just not entirely clear when it's cloudy and at some point it takes a little bit of work, but you get those clarities of goals and alignment and people are actually into it, like intrinsically into it. Um, and you get just this momentum, right? This like strong pull into the one direction. I think I've never, um, like I've, I've never like had anything else, you know, during my work life that excites me so much, such as this feeling. <laughs> I really, I really do enjoy that. And I think I would replicate that no matter um, if I had to work for, for money or not. And um, when in comics history, did you first get that sense of that kind of unity and that, you know, everyone's yeah. rowing in the right direction and that you know, you're, you're really, really onto something. Yeah, I think you lose it, you lose it and then you win it again. So for example, when I came back from like a little bit of a summer break um, and I, I, it was, it was an interesting phase because I never had that many people in the company. And it all of a sudden didn't take me two days to catch up on stuff, but it took me one and a half weeks because now we have a sales team, a customer success team, a product team, right? And it took me so long to get up to speed and just understanding what, what data I should look at in terms of like people speaking to me, 
right? So what, what is the stuff that I really should listen to and what is just like not so important? Um, and we, we normally get this, like Chris and I, like my co-founder and I get it a lot when we work together on stuff and hadn't been looking at certain issues before, or we get it a lot when, when we, uh, we meet as a founders team and then just align on what should happen the next quarter and like also kill, kill certain things out that has been in the back of our mind for a while. And we're just like, no, we're not going to do this. We focus on this one thing, right? And then you normally get this idea. And normally, I think it normally takes after alignment, it takes one to two weeks until everybody's briefed. But then you just get this feeling where all of a sudden, I don't know, features are just dropped, clients are just won, you know, issues are just solved. Like, it's, and, and you just realize, like, yeah, that's like this, the, those moments. And then you have phases where there's lots of change happening again, and you lose your balance a little bit again, right? And it takes time to get everybody um, really rowing to the same direction for a bit. But yeah, so it comes and goes, I would say. Cool. Um, we've also got um, a couple of um, questions from um, our community that it would be great to, to fire through. Um, so one of um, the guys in our community, a guy called Dan Springfield, has asked, you know, what tips do you have for getting into Google um, if you don't have a, a tech background? Right. So, I mean, Fred and I are the best examples. We got into Google without, a, you know, computer engineering background, right? And we both worked uh, in, in, you know, basically account management and consulting roles um, at Google. So there is definitely space for Google, especially these days for all sorts of people, right? It really depends on, you know, what your background is and what you actually want to do. Um, I know by now that Google is definitely not looking as much at schools anymore as they used to because they, they, they couldn't find a correlation between great schools and great performance in Google, which I'm just like, nice. You know, that's like, that takes the, I think it takes the anxiety off for people like me who didn't come from an Ivy League school to join Google. And I think it's absolutely right. Like we see this too. Like we have people who, you know, walk the floor with Ivy League guys, um, you know, not coming from great universities. So I think there's space for everybody. It really depends, I think, on what you want to do, what roles you're interested in. And I would stick to my first recommendation, which is find the stuff that you're interested in, see what resonates, reach out to the people, understand what they do, understand if you like what they do, if you would like that job, and then just see if you can somehow hone those skills and learn what's required. It's interesting because um, in many ways it goes back to, uh, what you were saying earlier about message market fit, right? So, you know, find out what the market wants. In this case, um, you know, what you know, Google's looking for and then, you know, hone your message accordingly. Yeah, it's like if, if I was mean, I would just say just, just try to be useful, right? And that's also mm -hmm. obviously a very abstract thing. But once you're useful, it's not that much of a problem. So how, how do you become actually useful? Um, ask people without, put your ego aside, and forget what you want to hear, but ask them about their problems and what mm. problems they're trying to solve and see if you can bring something to the table and help them achieve that. And then things are not that complicated. It, it goes back to um, a conversation we had a few months ago about the book, The Mom Test, which I think is a book that um, you know, has had a, a big impact on, on you and your work at Comics. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely love The Mom Test. And it's like, I think the mom... So th the mom test, lean startup, you know, there's many ways on how to approach this, you know, way of like looking not at your own ideas and falling in love with them and then eventually getting very disappointed if they're not useful, but rather forget everything you know and then talk to people, find out about the problems and then solve for that, right? And the mom test is just another small book that I really, you should actually link it below. It's, it's just very, very helpful. It's from a former Y Combinator alumni who's actually a product guy. But it teaches you a lot about, you know, um, not only about product. He, of course, comes from a product perspective. Um, but it also teaches you a lot about just finding the right stuff to focus on mm. um, when founding a business or even your career for that matter, right? I mean, yeah. I, in the end, you know, I was, I was, I was joining engineering um, not because I was, like, super excited about it, but, but I knew there was a need for engineers, right? And even though I didn't end up um, doing that, it was still useful, right? So... And um, I think yeah, once just just keep it like just 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 forget about like <laughs> your ideas sometimes. Uh, you know that doesn't mean you shouldn't be idealistic about stuff, but do understand that other people have problems, and the more useful you are, um, the more fun it becomes to solve those problems because those positive feedback loops, you know, 
they win they win a thousand times over one idea that doesn't help anybody and just gets frustrating like yeah that's really good feedback and um the next question from the community is from um, a woman called Naomi Bennett. And um, she says that um, AI or the use of AI in, in sort of sales and marketing is an exploding industry. And Comex seems to be going from strength to strength. How do you guys handle being in such a competitive uh, environment? Yeah, so I think the competition, that was actually something where, which we thought about a lot, like should we really enter the space? There's so much competition. But what's really fun is when you're in a competitive space and somehow make it to a level where you're extremely useful and people, other people around you cannot do what you're doing, is actually that um, if, if, the, if the space was not relevant, it wouldn't be competitive, right? Mm -hmm. So competition is actually a good thing. And then how you handle it personally, because you see stuff from competitors, you see ads from competitors, right? And of course, I think it's actually quite healthy, but of course, sometimes it's draining, right? But the main thing is really not to focus too much on your competition and rather focus on your customer. And that's also why I think, I think if we would have focused on competition and just ran after that, after those guys in 2016, 17, um, I'm not sure if we would have made it like that that far, right? So we rather, and it's similar, Jeff, Jeff Bezos talks about it a lot from Amazon, right? Um, it's just about that we just obsessed over the problem and just didn't really look at the competition, but rather applied our, our solutions to those problems we found. And eventually got very good at that, got extremely helpful for some people. Um, and that's just, that's probably will just create more value for your business over time as well. Just become more useful instead of become just like or better than your competition. Like, you know, you, you, you're you way more likely to become better than your competition by staying close to your customers rather than looking left and right to your competitors. Great. And um, another guy from our community called Anurag says, although a few individuals are willing to try new methods to get ahead, it often takes a while for organizations to take that leap of faith. So how do you get sales and marketing teams to buy into um, an artificial intelligence product? Yeah, it's, it's a good question, right? And I think it might come from his experience of like new technologies, not, you know, or like the market not being ready for adopting your technology. And that's a common issue for like people who have very bold ideas going out and then, you know, meet the market and it's actually not so fun anymore, right? Because maybe it's just a, a 0.01% that might implement your solution. So in our case, so we have like, I can say it's let out. We, can, we have a closing rate from first meeting demo to like close customer of 25%, right? And that's not a coincidence because we've used our own tool to really depict what is needed and what is useful for this target group. So that means, you know, people don't buy us because of AI. People buy us because we have a track record in solving a specific problem. And then we use AI to make those processes more scalable, more accurate and better, mm -hmm. right? Which means that, um, we didn't really come up like with the idea of AI for sales. We used AI to make certain things faster and better and of higher quality using mm -hmm. language processing and machine learning, right? But the the ideas like of for the problems we're solving come from our customers. Our customers are our main source of product development because those guys are the most important ones. They will tell us where they have the problem that we then need to solve in order to stay in business and stay useful for them. So that's why we never had that problem. Like we never went out with a bold idea of the, how we think the world should be. I think like, we believe that our customers know pretty well what bugs them and it's our job to make that better. And that's why we simply do not have the issue of going out with a too bold claim or too bold technology because um, the technology isn't there because we invented it. The technology is there because it made things useful for the people who buy from us. Yeah. I mean, one of my favorite quotes is, um, you know, people don't buy um, quarter inch drills. They buy quarter inch holes, i.e. what they're wanting is the thing that the technology enables. And it seems like you guys are so clear that you're not selling the technology itself. You know, you're selling the thing that the technology does. And that is solves, um, that is uh, solving their problems. Yeah. I mean, I would even go as far as, you know, if we've found a way to create similar results in that quality, people wouldn't care at all how we do it. Mm. So, um, yeah, that's also to obsess about how you do stuff is, is not, not nearly as good investment of resources and rather looking at, okay, 
what can get us to those results. Mm. Well, Philip, it's um, been a real pleasure um, chatting to you today. Um, I'm sure our um, your audience is going to find the conversation incredibly useful. If they want to find more about um, Comex or more about you, you know, where can they where can they find you? Sure, just um, hit us up on comics.io. Um, you find some information there. We have a huge resource center on just generally B2B uh, marketing and sales for very technical um, products. Or just hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, we do, I think, three times a week um, video content specifically on how to run sales organizations, how to find product market and message market fit, and how to shorten your deal cycles, how to make things a little bit more pleasant. Um, <laughs> in the departments which are actually creating all the revenue for all those businesses but um, people do not have a very positive association with that so um, uh, hit me up there awesome I remember a sales guy told me that in business there are two departments there's sales and there's sales support <laughs> <laughs> that's probably accurate um, and are you hiring at the moment or do you have plans um, to, to bring on new people yeah, we actually do. We went for a big chunk um, this year, and next year we're going to bring on more um, more people. So it's, it's mostly sales um, because everybody who works for our marketing or customer success teams or even product um, has to go through the sales journey um, because our knowledge has to be so specific and unique um, that uh, everybody just has to go through the grind once. Um, but our guys are performing well. We ramp people in no time. So if you are really into B2B entrepreneurship, or um, commercial operations, um, it's a good idea to start with uh, direct sales and somebody who's actually done it. Awesome. Well, Philip, it's been a real pleasure and um, hopefully catch you soon. Thanks. Cheers, buddy. See you soon. Bye.